What an awesome, isn't he an awesome teacher and a great man? Are, are we? Are, let's give God a praise for Dr. Miles. It's awesome to have him. I'm glad he comes here. He loves coming here because he understands the hill and vision. Very few ministers. I talk to ministers from big cities, and they go, oh, yeah, that's great. I mean, they just don't get it. But he gets it because I don't know whether you realize this or not, but Dr. Miles was uh, a minister in ministry in Zimbabwe, uh, and they had had a revolution there, and they had killed white farmers and taken their land. And the government had taken over, and the guy represented himself as being a Christian. It turns out he wasn't, but it was actually demonic. And so there was poverty in the country. It was terribly impoverished. And Dr. Miles was one of the first ministers to say, the Lord has shown me we, we have, we've got to break curses. Y'all have brought a curse on this land. And so he led the church to lead the charge to break the curse off of the earth, off of the land, from the illegal acts of the previous of the government and and right before and the, there was big revival huge revival broke out in the nation of Zimbabwe and before he left right before he left the dictator surrendered his position they had a bloodless coup only God can do a bloodless coup amen and turned the government over to a friend of his who was a Christian man and and so today Zimbabwe has broken the curse off their land. They're prosperous in an incredible way. They're 85% Christian. 85% Christian. 85% tongue talking, water walking, as Roger says, Christians. And their government is Christian. And, and so he understands the heal land concept because he's seen it work in his country. Amen? So, uh, so that's why he feels kindred here. He's in Orlando now, he and brother Robert Henderson and they're awarding, they're, they have some special ceremony for them. But uh, I just love having him come. I, I hope you love him as much as I do. Uh, I love trying to figure out what he's saying when he talks fast. In the, and when the anointing moves, he talks faster and faster and it gets harder and harder. So I ask his wife, I just ask Carmela, what do you say? She tells me. So I have an interpreter all the time. But uh, uh, I wanted to talk to you this morning. So we were in Abernathy. I was to tell you, we were in Abernathy, Texas, where God is moving. The churches there have have united. They call it Abernathy United, the Methodist, Baptist, um, Church of Christ, uh, Charismatic Church, all of them have all come together under one heading and one banner. It's an incredible thing God is doing there. And you're going to see more of that as time goes along. And so the Lord is really moving there, and they had a large revival there, and they asked me to come in the cotton gin in the seed barn and and it was it, i was standing on a truck bed and uh sweating like a pig water dripping all around me but anyway i'm preaching off the truck bed and uh, they had big uh uh, uh cooters in the back and a lot of people were sitting in the back because they were by the porticooler and the three rows in the front i was too loud for them you know they were going to turn it down and the guys in the back were looking at each other what is he saying you know so it's one of those kind of deals so I didn't know whether anybody was getting what we were saying, and then we gave an invitation. We had about 25 or 30 came up for ministry. So uh, the whole, you cannot do that. Oh, the Holy Spirit can work uh, regardless of the circumstance. Amen? How many of you have the gift of tongues? This is good. This is very good. How many of you pray in your spiritual language every single day of your life? Yeah. So me and Ryan, we've been in a drought, and Bill, so we're the only ones that so. Uh, it's this is a this is a this is a really really controversial gift and it doesn't need to be controversial it shouldn't be controversial but I want to spend some time would y'all like to look into the whole gift of tongues and the baptism of the Holy Spirit and spend some time on that and get some solid doctrine on that amen turn to Acts chapter 2 verse 1 Acts chapter 2 2 verse 1 hey this works pretty good here with the stool I like that can you get me on the thing right okay perfect I don't move around. I'm not moving around. I'm chained in one place. You really like that, don't you? Yeah, he does. He said the bearings are wearing out on his camera. He's trying to follow me up and down. We're pacing up and down the thing all the time. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. It's good to be back, by the way. I've had to somebody else in my pulpit for like three consecutive weeks, and I was getting jealous. I was ready to. So uh, anyway, it's good to be back, be preaching to the church, teaching again. Verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. And suddenly there came. So the one accord thing is really important. You can't have division in a church and expect it to move in the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen? The church has got to get in one accord. 
They were all in one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound of, a he of heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house, and they were sitting. And then they appear it appeared to them, and then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit, I want you to say this last part with me, as the Spirit gave them utterance. Say it again. As the Spirit gave them utterance. Okay. So this was the first manifestation and the first gift of the new covenant to manifest and and it was the very first thing the Holy Spirit did I want you to understand there is there is there is biblical interpretation called the law of first mention whenever something the first time it happens is a significant time that's when you need to study it because there there's doctrinal things you can extract out of the first occurrence they call it the law of first mention this is the law of first mention also there's a there's a there is a doctrinal principle called uh, uh, the original mention. In other words, if it is a doctrine of the church, you ought to be able to find it in Genesis. Too many people are building doctrines out of minor things, out of other books. If, there, if it is a doctrine of the church, you should be able to find the, the thing in the book of Genesis. So where is tongues in Genesis? Pardon? Genesis chapter 11, the Tower of Babel. He confused their languages. And whenever he, why did he confuse their language? Anybody tell me why he decided he wanted to confuse their language? Mm -hmm. Brother Webb used to say, so they built the Tower of Babel thinking the higher they could get, the closer they could get to God. And so they were beginning, so listen, this is important now. This, this, was, a, this was the first advent of religion. Say it's religious. Amen. Of religion in the Bible. What is religion? Our definition of religion is a man-made approach to the presence of God. A man-made approach to the presence of God. Men do something and it brings them into the presence. They light a certain candle. They say a certain prayer. They rub a certain bead. They do whatever. Some mechanism, some formula for coming into the presence of God. It's called religion, and it's from the devil. Religion is the counterfeit for the spiritual life. The spiritual life is having a unique relationship with God where you can come into his presence at any time because he's living and alive inside of you. That's the spiritual life. And so this was the first preemptive strike against a one-world religion, which is where we're headed. We know closer Jesus gets, the closer we're headed to a one-world religion, right? And so they were out of step, too, because that can't happen until Revelation. It was occurring way too early. And so God struck that, and he confused their language so they would not be able to come together and continue to develop this one-world religion. And so whenever the gift of tongues was the first thing given by the Holy Spirit, it was an undoing of the curse of Genesis chapter 11. The Holy Spirit is your interpreter. The Holy Spirit is your interpreter. You don't need an interpreter. You don't got to have a degree in Hebrew and Greek. You have to have the Holy Spirit. You read the word and ask the Holy Spirit what it means, and he will tell you in whatever language is your common language. If it's Spanish, he tells you in Spanish. If it's, He's a master of languages. The Holy Spirit is a master of languages. So if, if you speak French, he'll tell you in French what it means. However he can get understanding into your mind, that's what he does. You don't got to go to get, I know many great guys that are, that are, that have got degrees in Hebrews and Hebrew and Greek, and that's wonderful. I'm not against that. And I love to do word studies and all that kind of stuff, but you don't got to have that to know what God is trying to say. Amen. So, uh, it was the undoing of the Genesis 11 curse and, uh, and notice that it wasn't the spirit speaking. Now this is something that I think is a block for those of you that have not developed this gift. I think this part you don't understand. Listen to me. Read, read verse, verse 4 again. They spoke as the Spirit gave them utterance. So it wasn't the Spirit speaking. It was them speaking what the Spirit told them to say. The mind, the human mind is never going to be, God doesn't expect you to be a robot, a syncophant up here. Just, just your, your mind is always going to be, your will is always going to be involved. 
Every time God asks you to do something, you get to vote. He's not here to dominate your will. He refuses to overtake your will. That's of the devil. The demonic, the sign of the demonic is that you have lost possession of your will and the devil is in possession of it and you can't stop doing what you're doing even when you know it's wrong because your will is no longer your own. God, that's the devil. That's the kingdom of darkness. God intends for you to be in charge of your will. So the Holy Spirit speaks a word into your mind, and right there and then and there, your mind is going to say, either I will say it or I won't. Many of you are waiting to be, you know, taken up in some sort of a trance where you're barking like a dog or whatever. I mean, I don't know. I've seen some weird stuff. But... Uh, that's none of that, none of that. It's, it is, it is the spirit speaking to your mind and your mind subjecting itself to the dominant position. Hear me now. The three-in-one nature of God, body, spirit, mind, spirit, soul, and body. What happened in the garden? Adam ate of the tree of knowledge and his spiritual nature became subservient to the flesh. And Adam lived out of his flesh from then on. The flesh being the alliance between the soul and the body. Jesus said, I come to reverse that process to make your spiritual nature your dominant nature. And so the spirit speaks to the mind and the mind does what the spirit, it says, it tells the tongue to say what the spirit is telling it to say. And here's why, if you don't get this gift, you can't pray for healing and save somebody who's dying because it's the same principle. It's your mind saying the word of God. The spirit says, speak this over your own body. Speak this. And you speak it in obedience and then when you do that, you release the word of healing into your body. If you're going to go, well, that didn't make any sense to me. I'm not going to say it. Then you're not going to get any healing. Is this making any sense? It's, a, it's, a, it's your mind returning to its place of being subservient to the spirit. The spirit speaks. The mind says, okay, tongue, get ready. This is what we're going to say. The tongue goes, I don't know what that means. The mind says, I don't care. Do it anyhow. You have to get to that place. You have to get to that place where you don't figure it out. You don't do things. You don't, I only do it if I understand it. Well, you're not going to do much for God if that's going to be your standard. Come on, is this making sense to anybody? Do you understand what I'm trying to say? You just do what God says to do. I say this all the time. Uh, if, you won't, if you won't speak in tongues, you won't prophesy. Well, what's that got to do with it? Because your mind is going to have to agree to say something to someone you don't even know about something you have no knowledge of, and your mind goes, hey, I don't know them. Until I know them a little better, I'm not doing that. You're not going to be a prophet, I guarantee you. It's the same process. The mind serving the spirit instead of the other way around. Have I lost you? Have I confused you? Do you understand that? Tongues is practicing that. Tongues is practicing that. So, this is the primary gift of all the spiritual gifts. Now, I want to read from you from the, um, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I have them try what doctor, hey, you got it up already? Did you see it on my notes? Awesome, thank you. This is not in your notes, so write it down. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. Has anybody got any questions about any of this so far? You understand mind serving the spirit? Okay, listen. This is what? I'm reading from the New Passion Translation. How many of you have the New Passions Translation? Boy, it's, it's rocking, isn't it? Now, now listen. These new translations, listen, these devotional translations don't study from the word from them. They're devotional. Uh, if you've read the Bible through ten times in your lifetime and you're kind of getting bored, try a devotional version because it's a little different wording. But if you want to study the principle or the doctrine, go into your to your new king your king james version or new king james version go to a basic version to to dig for truth okay because this is a guy's interpretation of what he thinks the holy spirit is trying to say and this guy happens to be pretty smart and so it's cool but it's not a study version do you understand what i'm trying to say so verse one this is what it says in the new passion and i don't know what she what do you got king james is that king james yeah okay New King James. So listen, you can kind of pick out the difference. For my, bell, for my fellow believers, I do not want you to be confused about spiritual realities. I don't want you to be confused about spiritual realities. Many of you are. You need to get unconfused about that. For you know full well that when you were unbelievers, you were often led astray in one way or another by the worship of idols 
which are incapable of talking with you. Therefore, I want to impart to you an understanding of the following. No one speaking by the Spirit of God would ever say Jesus is accursed. No one can say Jesus is the Lord Yahweh unless the Holy Spirit is speaking through him. It is the same, it's the same process. You cannot say that God is Lord unless the Holy Spirit prompts you to do that. Your mind has to say, okay, that, we're going to say that. It is the same Holy Spirit who continues to distribute many different varieties of gifts. The Lord Yahweh is one. He is the one who appro uh, apportions to believers several different varieties of ministries. The same God distributes different kinds of miracles that accomplish different results, though each believer's gift and ministry as he through, through each deliver, believer's gift of ministry as he energizes and activates them. If you don't energize and activate the gift, you ain't never going to have it. Can I get a witness out of somebody? Next week, we're going to pray on you to receive something. And, if, and you'll receive something, but Paul told Timothy, he said, stir up the gifts that God has placed in you by the laying on of hands. You have to energize and activate if you let your mind continuously deny your spirit, it will develop into a habit, and now you're in real trouble. Because your mind is just said, I'm rebelling. I, I don't, if I don't understand it, I'm not going to do it. You are not going to see spiritual progress. Does this make sense? You have to energize and activate the gift. Each believer is given continuous revelation by the Holy Spirit to benefit not just him, but everybody. For example, he says... The Spirit gives to one the gift of wisdom, a word of wisdom. To another, the Spirit gives the gift of the word of revelation, knowledge. To another, the same Spirit gives the gift of faith. To another, the Spirit gives the gift of healing. To another, the power to work miracles. To another, the gift of prophecy. To another, the gift to discern spirits. To another, the gift of speaking different kinds of tongues. And to another, the gift of interpretation of tongues. Remember, it is the same Holy Spirit who distributes, activates, and operates these gifts as he chooses in each believer. I don't have the gift. Well, ask the Holy Spirit for it. If you need it, he will give it to you. Amen? If you believe that, say amen. amen. So how many gifts were there? Who counted them? How many gifts were there? Nine gifts. How many, how many fruits of the Spirit are there? Galatians chapter 5. How many fruits of the Spirit are there? Fruit of the Spirit is long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, patience, faithfulness, self-control. How many of those are there? Nine. Nine is the number of the Holy, Holy Ghost. Amen? So there are nine gifts. How many, how, many, how many gifts to the church is there that Jesus gave to the church? There are five. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. So one of the ways you know that the gift is from the Holy Spirit is that it is, it is it, they will number, there will always be multiples of nine. So there are nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. All of them are important for you to learn how to uh, live your life interactively with the Holy Spirit. Uh, I love the fact that the, whole, that the new, new, the new uh, Passion Translation calls them spiritual realities. It doesn't call them gifts. Because the Greek word there in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 2 is not, is not charismata, which is the Greek for spiritual gift. It's nomikitos, which is, uh, uh, it is of spirit, so of a spiritual nature. So what, what Paul is saying here is, if you get these nine gifts and you understand them, then you will have a deep understanding of the way the spirit operates. And the gifts are given to you as exercises in court to, to help you learn how to live your life interactively with the Holy Spirit. They're exercises. You're a great baseball player. Hey, how'd you like playing baseball in Puerto Rico? Was that fun? Oh, yeah, I bet it was fun. I saw the pictures. You look like I didn't see much baseball, but I saw you having a lot of fun. That's what I saw. But if you don't learn how to hit, if you don't learn basic principles, and if you don't practice those hitting mechanics... Before you get to the plate, are you ever going to learn how to be a hitter? How many people do you know just walked up to the plate and hit the first time they swung the bat, they hit a home run? 
I figured you was going to say maybe I, that you did it. I didn't know. <laughs> it's the same way. You have to have to understand spiritual realities, to understand how to interface and live your life interactively with those, you got to practice the fundamentals. What are the fundamentals? Tongues, interpretation of tongues, prophecy, a word of wisdom, a word of revelation. Learn how to cultivate those, seek them, energize and activate the gifts in your life, in your everyday life. Now, why is it so important that you learn to live your life interactively with the Holy Spirit? Why is that so important? Anybody had any big decisions they had to make in the last 30 days? Life-changing decisions? Hey, how about this? Go to work or not go to work. Amen? That's a pretty big decision, huh? <laughs> Run the risk of getting the COVID. Man, you still get that clip of the southern guy that's teaching allergy, how to say allergies? Yeah. Listen, there's fear everywhere. You got to make a decision. You have to make a decision that you're not going to live by fear. Can I get a witness out of somebody? I will tell you this, you won't be able to do that unless you have been living your life interactively with the Holy Spirit because he's where your confidence comes from. He's where you're, you get the courage to say, I'm not going to get in fear like everybody else. I'm going to live my life. I curse the curved. The blood's the best face mask. How many of you, where's the mask? Who has a mask? Nobody in here has a mask. Good. I can go ahead and say this. You don't need one. You need the blood of Christ is what you need. Come on, somebody. I was in Walmart yesterday trying to get some simple little thing done. And I knew it was going to be a great test for me. And I had to wear my mask. And I started out pretty good. And then pretty soon the mask is half-masked. And then pretty soon I'm like, I ain't. I don't care if they throw me out. God deliver me. Let them throw me out of this place. I took my mask off towards the end. My point is, you see, somebody's had the same experience. Amen. Save me. Save me, God. Get me out of here. One of those kinds of things. But my point is, is that, is that I don't want to be irresponsible either. And if people are fearful, I want to be sensitive to that. But I want to ask them, do you pray in tongues? And they all go, no. Well, that's probably the reason why you're so fearful. Because you're not living your life every moment of every day interactively with the Holy Spirit. I have gone to horse sales and wanted to buy a horse. And because I lived my life interactively with the Holy Spirit, the Lord has said, don't buy that one, buy this one. You with me? This is why you need to develop that kind of relationship. The gifts are exercises in living that way. Amen? All right. So I want to teach you. I want to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 5. This is an important scripture. It's so important I forgot to mark it here in my Bible. 14. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14. You'll have to give me some time to get there. Verse 5. Hallelujah. So, he's talking about, uh, before, the, whole, the whole chapter 14 is talking about the gifts of tongues versus the gift of prophecy. And, and uh, let's go back. Let's go back to the gifts for just, a, just a minute. You can divide these nine gifts into three groups of three, okay? And they're here on your sheet. I think they are. No, they're not, are they? They're not on their sheet. So turn your sheet over and get your pen out and write this down. The first three gifts are the vocal gifts. They're the vocal gifts. The gift of tongues, interpretation of tongues, and prophecy. Those three gifts are vocal gifts. They have to do with you speaking. The gift of tongues, interpretation of tongues, and prophecy. Okay. The next three gifts are called revelation gifts. Revelation gifts. The word of wisdom. A word of wisdom is about the future. A word of knowledge. The word of knowledge is about the past or the present. Very often when you get a prophetic word from someone who's prophetic, they will give you a word of knowledge about your past to, bend it, to, to verify that they're hearing from God. You don't know them. You know they don't know nobody that knows you. You know there's no way that they knew that. The woman at the well, Jesus said, you answer correctly. You've had five husbands, and this one you're living with is not your husband. And he didn't do that to condemn her. He did that to verify 
that he was the Lord and he knew her situation and he was about to speak life into it and she could pay, needed to pay attention to what was coming next. A lot of times a prophet, a good prophet, will give you a word of knowledge about struggles from your past so that you will listen to the word he's about to give you for your future. Come on, somebody. And so a word of knowledge is about the past or the present. And then uh, there's the discerning of spirits. These are the three revelation gifts. You get around somebody who has a spirit of mammon, and you know right away that they're afflicted with the spirit of mammon or whatever. Don't ever try deliverance ministry if you don't have the discerning, the gift of discerning of spirits. The devil will cut you to pieces spiritually because you don't. He will, he'll lie to you. He's not going to tell you what kind of spirit he has. I get I get fascinated by that. I see guys try to do deliverance ministry and they go, "What's your name?" My name's Bill Grilke. You want my address? I'll give it to you. They're going to lie to you. They're going to tell you who they are. Anyway, so you have to have a discerning of spirits. The third set of gifts is the power gifts. The power gifts. The gift of miracles, the gift of healings, and the gift of faith. I thought you had faith. I thought you had faith. Hey, Manny, can you do me a favor? Would you go get me a water bottle out of Mama's car? She, she stole my water bottle, so that's why I don't have one in here. It's, it's in a cooler behind her. The gift of faith. I thought you had faith. Why do you need the gift of faith? This is way above and beyond. This is a sign gift of the Holy Spirit, sign of his presence that he imparts to you. And all of a sudden, you have a faith that's like a crazy faith. You can believe for the most radical unbelievable things if you have the gift of faith. Thank you, honey. That's, that didn't come out of the cooler. Oh, you oh, okay. Anyway. It caused you to lose your train of thought. Listen, when you have the gift of faith, you can believe for something that is so radical, so God puts it in you and you have it, and you just and you know that it's going to come to pass, and everybody goes, man, where do they get that faith? It's a gift from the Holy Spirit. Anybody ever know anybody like that? I mean, they can believe for anything, and you see miracles. I really think the gift of miracles and the gift of healings and gift of faith are all so interconnected, it's hard to tell one from the other. Amen? But I'm talking about there's times when I've had to believe for something, and it was tough, and I asked the Holy Spirit for the gift of faith, and he gave it to me. And all of a sudden, I quit worrying about it. And all of a sudden, I just had the power to believe, and I knew that it was going to come to happen, come to pass. Amen? So, those are the nine gifts. Now, I want you to go to 1 Corinthians 14, <laughs> verse 5. And so, there's this controversy that started by misinterpretation of 1 Corinthians chapter 14 in the non-believing church. They don't pray in tongues, I promise you. They can't believe for nothing. They don't have faith enough to believe for rain or anything else. But, it, but they started this controversy, and they said even Paul said he would prefer that you prophesy than, than speak in tongues, and that's not what he said. So in verse 5, I want you to go to verse 5. Paul said, and this is a scripture they use a lot. He said, I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied, for he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks in tongues unless he indeed interprets and the church may receive edification. Here's what the actual Greek interpretation is of this passage. I prefer that you, uh, he said, I wish that you all spoke with tongues in order that you may prophesy. The principle I just told you. If you won't pursue this gift, you're, not, you're going to be reluctant to be a prophetic uh, instrument of any kind. And so he's saying the idea is, is for you to get to where you're a reliable prophet, where you can speak to the church and really build it up, but it's going to start with your private devotional time of praying in tongues. And there's a lot of times, I've been with Brother Jim, whenever he's ministering at the altar, and uh, someone would come up, and they would need, and he would need a prophetic word for them, and he had nothing. I could tell that I've known him long enough, I knew he had nothing. And I thought, man, I feel a lot better. There's a lot of times people come up to me in prayer, I got nothing. But here's what he would do. He would lay his hand on them, and he would begin to speak in tongues. And as he spoke in tongues, pretty soon he would get a word. I prefer that you speak in tongues so that in order you might prophesy. Because the prophecy is what builds the church up. 
But you can't, you got to do, you got to do both. To, you got to do one to get to the other. 14.4 says, he who prophesies edifies the church, and that's what he's after. He's after edification of the church, and that's what this passage is all about. So, uh, <clears throat> anybody got any questions? This is the one spiritual gift that's exclusive to the New Testament. The other eight spiritual gifts, you can find some form of them in the Old Testament, okay? Identification, discerning of spirits, all of that kind of thing. You know, there were there were ex, there were exorcists in the priest, uh, the, the 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 rabbis did those all the time. Uh, there were tons of prophets in the Old Testament that had a prophetic word, word of knowledge, and word of word of uh, uh, of revelation. They had all the things, but this gift, this gift is unique to the New Testament and the New Covenant, and so uh, spiritual language is exclusive to the New Testament. Now. There's two ways the way this is looked at by the, by the writers of the Bible. Luke wrote the book of Acts. Did you know that? Luke, the disciple of Paul, wrote the book of Acts. And whenever he saw the gift in operation, or whenever they told stories about it, here's what he saw. Verse 6, go back to Acts chapter 2. Go back to Acts chapter 2. And let's go to, uh, uh, let's start in verse 5. This happened during Pentecost. What is Pentecost? What is Pentecost? Yes, but it's it's a it's a feast, right? Who said that? Marissa. So it's a feast. The Jews have been celebrating the feast. So what other significant event happened on the first Pentecost? What happened on the very first Pentecost? Anybody know? Moses on the mountain. God gave him the word. He gave him the Torah. That happened on Pentecost. And so thousands of years later, God gives them the Holy Spirit so that they can learn how to live with the revelation of the Torah, the law, on the exact same day of Pentecost. That's no accident, right? And so at Pentecost in Jerusalem, what would that have been like? Thousands of people, right, from all over. It was a, it was a holy day to the Jews. And so Jews came from every, every, every tongue, from, from Ethiopia and all over. They came to Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost. Verse 5. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. They were there for the feast. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and they were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled. And they said to one another, look, are these Galileans? And now they're speaking in our language. It's called glossae in the Greek. And that was the first advent of tongues. And so Luke, so Luke saw this as a missional gift, as a way for me to go to Mexico and minister, and I don't even know Spanish. He saw, and think about this now, Luke was a Jew now, and, and he saw the potential of this, of reaching out to people. This, this, this rocked his whole world. He thought all of this would be within the confines of Judaism and the Jews. And now he's seeing that Jesus intends to burst out of that and go out to the, to the Gentiles. And we can preach in Greece and Rome and everywhere. And he was excited about the missional aspect of tongues. He was so blown away with the potential for ministry and to bring people into the kingdom that he never dreamed that you would ever reach out to. He was fired up. But his mentor, Paul, did not see this as a missional gift. He didn't see it as a missional gift. He saw it as a devotional gift. Turn to um, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 again. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Verse 1. 1 through 4. Now, Paul wrote this book. And here's what he said. So we're going to read 1 through 4. Are we there already? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I mean uh, chapter 14, verse 1 through 4. Well, she got it. Okay, here we go. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. Desire them. Do you desire tongues? I know Roger always says... Christians go, do I got to pray in tongues? No, you get to, brother. You don't have to. You get to. 
You've got to desire the gift. Pursue, he says, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. There goes this. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, and no one understands him. Wait a minute. That's not what Luke said. However, in the spirit he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification, and exhortation, and comfort to men. But he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. Is that a bad thing? Have there any been times in your life when you needed a little self-edification? Come on, somebody. Tongues is how you get it. You pray in tongues, and it strengthens you spiritually. He who speaks in tongues, that was verse 5. How far was I, did I tell you we wanted to go? Oh, okay, I already went one more than what? So, so he said, the verse 5 we talked about, I wish that you spoke in tongues so that you might prophesy. So, so clearly, Paul sees the gift of tongues as a powerful, powerful devotional gift. And if you want to build up your inner man, you have got to pursue this gift. How many of you have ever been in a situation where you didn't know what to pray? I mean, you were scared. What comes out of your mouth? Spiritual language. When you can't pray with understanding, the spirit in you can pray to the spirit. It's a spirit-to-spirit -spirit transaction. And, and, and the cool thing about it is, and we're going to talk about this next week, it terrifies the devil. Because it's been encoded. And he can't decrypt it. He doesn't know what you're saying, but he knows that it's spiritual language. And he knows you're praying spirit to spirit. And it cannot be good for him. You want to put the devil on the run? You try praying in tongues. It will send the devil packing quicker than any gift that you will ever have. And in the meantime, it's spirit to spirit encoded for your protection the, the Holy Spirit starts speaking things into you and it starts strengthening you. You came up on a wreck. you got a guy laying here and he's bleeding to death and he's barely alive and you don't know what to do. Start out by just praying in the Spirit. And when you start praying in the Spirit, it will bring a calmness to your mind. They've actually done studies. Uh, Wisconsin University did a study on people that practice this devotional gift often and they took regular Christians, or just, re I should say regular Christians. So that did that backwards. Regular Christians should pray in tongues all the time. They took the non-spiritual Christians that just pray in, you know, words with, and with understanding. Anyway, they, 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 they put electrogram things, whatever you call those little things on their head, to measure their brain waves. In your frontal lobe, it's your reasoning. It's where you try to work problems out. You're thinking, trying to think, figure out how a solution so whenever the, the, the non-spiritual Christians would pray, then that brain activity would be going wild. They're, they're left lobe. You're going to be a psychologist. You need to remember this. Learned it in church. Their left lobe will be, going, will be just going wild. Then they would do the same thing with Christians that, would, and they, uh, that, that had the spiritual gift of tongues. They would start out the same way. And then when they started to pray in the spirit, their left lobe just got quiet. Their mind got quiet. Their blood pressure dropped. Their heart rate dropped. They entered into some sort of a shalom of God, some sort of a peace where there, 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 was, no, there was no anxiety. Anxiety would begin to be deplete out of their system. This is why their blood, their blood pressure and their heart rate and their brain waves begin to, to get into just a quietness, say, I need to be still before the Lord. Tongues is how you do it. And so they did another study at OR, uh, OR Roberts University, and they studied the immune systems. This is a word in due season. They studied the immune systems of Christians that prayed in tongues on a regular basis as part of their devotional life. Guess what? Their immune response was 40% stronger than on people that just prayed regularly. And I think 60% stronger than people that never prayed at all. Not only does it bring a quietness to your spirit and your soul, it actually strengthens your immune system. How many of you would like to have a stronger immune system in the times that we're living in? 
I really wish that I could do the study. I want to go to the CDC and take over for a month. And I want to say, give me all of the Christians that pray in tongues and put them in this category and all everybody else, put them in the other one. And let's see how many of them developed COVID-19 coronavirus. I just would like to know. Because I'm just going to make a bold statement here. I know no tongue-talking Christian that I know and am in close relationship with to know they really do it that has contracted COVID-19. And I know a lot of them that have been exposed, so much so they made them go into a quarantine, forcibly quarantine. It strengthens your immune system. It quiets your spirit. It quiets your mind. It gets you where you can focus on God with more, with just a peace. Amen? How many of you think we need that? I broke my watch band, and now my watch is somewhere in my pocket. I don't know where it is. It's in one of my pockets. And what time is it? That could that would work. Let I me mean, just ask somebody. What time is it? Huh? Oh, okay. Well, I'm going past where. I... <laughs> How many of you find this this study interesting? Okay, we're going to talk about, so we're going to talk about, oh, I just broke my podium. I really have enjoyed it. Now i got to glue it back in. Uh, I, want you to, I want you to come back next week, and we're going to talk about what stimulates tongues in your life is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I want you to understand the baptisms, because there are three of them, and they're in Scripture. And I want you to have really good, sound doctrine in all the baptisms, uh, the baptism into the body of Christ, the baptism of water baptism, and the baptism in being immersed in the Holy Spirit. You hear a lot of Christians, other Christians say, well, I got the Holy Spirit when I got saved. Yeah, you did, but you weren't soaked in it yet. It was in you for salvation. It's got to come in you for power, on you for power. And there's a process where that happens. And one of the things that usually happens, we're going to talk about the biblical accounts of that, is uh, now it didn't exactly happen to me that way, but uh, that when you get baptized in the Holy Spirit, you usually have this manifestation of spiritual language. Amen. So uh, we're going to close with communion. And uh, listen, Jesus came here to do more than get you into heaven. That's a big benefit. I, I'm not denying that. That's, that's good news. But he came here to establish an ecclesia is the Greek word on the earth. We interpret it as church. But if he looked at most of the church today in America, I'll be honest with you, he would say, that's not what I came to do. An ecclesia was a Greek body of government that was a representative of the people. They were about 10% of the total population. They were people of insight, people of wisdom that made cultural decisions for the Greek culture. They made decisions about what they should be doing and what they should not be doing. They were an enormous influence on Greek civilization. You couldn't, you couldn't elect a judge without the approval of the ecclesia. Jesus brought you together to live in a, in a spiritual reality where you have insight to what ought to happen for the nation and you ought to be guiding the guiding light for America and not being shoved under the, the table as a bunch of looney tunes that nobody believes in. Let me tell you, they don't believe in. I want to say this. You, the, the Pentecostal movement around the world is the fastest growing spiritual movement in the history of the church. There are 616 million Pentecostals in the world that didn't exist 10 years ago. People who study these kinds of things say they have never seen anything like it, and nobody predicted it. God is moving on the earth. In only barren, dry deserts of America is the only place where the Holy Spirit is not moving in power and organizing his ecclesia that is now starting to have a tremendous influence in the cultural directions of the nations of Zambia, Zimbabwe, Zimbabwe. Uh, just name them, all the African nations, Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, parts of Europe, Latin America, China. My God, the church in China 
Listen, don't believe one minute. The Communist Party is withering like a snake with its head cut off because the Christians in China are having an enormous impact on the culture. And they're worried about it. How do you get people to join your church whenever you don't even, when there's a good chance that they might get all their property confiscated and might be sent off to a prison camp for the rest of their life? You demonstrate the power of the Holy Ghost. And people all of a sudden say, you know what? I don't care about the communist. I'm going to follow Jesus. Amen? Jesus wants to do the same thing here that he's doing all over the world. We just got to embrace this thing. And the remnant church is rising up, and the remnant church talks in tongues, I hate to tell you. It's a gift that they operate in and, and that they believe in strongly and that they, and they practice because it's in the Bible, and they believe everything that's in the Bible. Amen? So we're going to serve communion today, and we're going to celebrate the gifts that God has given us and laid out for us so that we can operate with a power that the world just doesn't have and that we can have an influence over the world that it needs. Come on, somebody. I'll say one other thing, too, about it. I've been accused of being a quack, you know, because I pray in tongues and do all this stuff, but I've noticed something. When their wife has got cancer and she's been called terminal, they call me for prayer. And I don't say that with pride. I'm not bragging. I'm saying when people are desperate, they lay the religion down. You see what I'm saying? Lay the religion down. Religion will get you nowhere but a headache. That's all religion will get you. The spiritual life will set you free. Amen.